you know, each time this goes bad, it is Travis and John's fault. <laughs> Not hardly, because I was in here yesterday just uh, trying to work through it, and I called Travis and said, Travis, I suspect there may be something going on, and they told me what to do, and I got it straight for a while. But you know, no computer is going to cause us to miss the importance of this day. Because this is a great day. But this is the day the Lord has made. And we choose to rejoice and to be glad in it. Amen. And we have some visitors today. Miss Dawn, I want to say welcome to our service this morning. And you, you are here and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with that fiance or yours, you know, to get him here as well. So I suspect by the time the wedding goes on, he'll be here. All right. And then I have the visit of my oldest and my two grandsons. They come in from Miami on way to Los Angeles. And they had to be related because they're not scared to sit up here with you. I think everybody else thinks she's got COVID or something. Yeah, that's They're yeah. in the back. You know, those are those are typical Baptist people. <laughs> <laughs> and as we said, Brother Wes is here. Yes, All righty. Welcome back. And his lovely wife, Leona, and her sister, who have been here before, and I didn't get the name again. Joyce. Joyce. Miss Joyce is here. Amen. Man, it is um, uh, as you can tell. Now, I thought about this. You know, I purchased this shirt for a day like today. And I thought about it and I said, wow, I may be the only pastor in America that would wear a shirt like this. But then so be it. Because I think it is most appropriate for this is a great day. Fourth of July is one of my great holidays. By the way, I've already been up and I've already got some some St. Louis ribs over the fire right now, aren't they? They're getting ready. And we're going to tear them up today, aren't we? Ribs and chicken and key lime pie and corn on the cob and all kinds of things uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. You want to be there, huh? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let it rip because I look forward to days like today. And... Our opening slide, welcome, welcome, come on in guys. Our opening slide is, uh, you probably can't see the titles on each of them, but you can suspect what it would say. One is the Constitution, the other is the Bill of Rights, and the third is the Emancipation Proclamation. All of those are freedom documents. And all of those documents stand on the foundation of the Bible. Now, I don't know of any country that truly has their, their manner of operation, their very the essence of their existence, Standing on the foundation of the word of God. That separates us. It does. It says that God's hand is on this land. This is God's land. You know, when I had the opportunity to teach children 20, 25 years ago, one of the first things I wanted to do was that. I took those three documents and I created a slide and on those documents sit on the, the Bible to make clear to every child that came through the ministry who they were and whose they were. And that they had rights and privileges that came from the Lord. The God, look at the Lord used men 
to construct those documents. He also used circumstances and situations to bring those documents to where they're real. Now we understand that in doing so, they're going to be potholes. There are going to be circumstances and situations. <laughs> but it's not that I take them and throw them out. Because they're my very foundation. They are who I am. Amen? I came up in a large family. There were eight of us. And you can only imagine that's back in the day when American families had big families. I mean, folks weren't afraid of having big old families. Call me anything but late for dinner. But I can recall some days when, when, when my father was, a, was away from work and my mother was trying to get things done in the house. I can recall some days where we children carried on. And sometimes we didn't even act like family. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? You sit back and go, are these children even related? However, if someone from outside the family came in to do something for one of the families, all of those deals we were going through, <laughs> all that went out the window. <laughs> because when you touched one, you had to deal with the whole crew. And I remember coming up where I came up, and they sit back and go, leave those scrubs children alone, because if you mess with one, they got a whole army going to come and get you. That's very much so like America is. We're family. We don't like, we well, you know, we don't like one another. But it is what it is. So today, we have this double blessing that we come to celebrate 4th of July and in conjunction with that, we have the Lord's Supper. And I want to pull the two of them together because both is about freedom. Both are about freedom. So I want to start off with, with our scripture. Not supposed to do that. There we go. Isaiah 61, 1, verses 1 and 2. Um. Isaiah have been instructed to speak concerning what will happen in the days ahead. That there's going to be brokenness. There's going to be people that's going to lose their way, but the Lord has a plan. And the Lord is going to send one. And when he comes... He's going to have above, upon him the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourns. Isaiah foretold of the one to come and what he would represent. Freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of bondage. Freedom from sin. You know, what I've learned is that freedom is the crowning jewel of man's existence. Freedom is the crowning jewel. It's at the heart of man's existence. So man want to be free. 
in our battles of freedom will continue. Whether they're physical or spiritual, we will always be engaged in this battle. In whatever form, however the search for freedom has been, a fundamental urge at every point in American history, that's where freedom has been. From the pilgrims to the civil rights movement, this push for freedom. Jesus came that we would be free. The founding fathers of our Declaration of Independence signed on the memorial. Look here, this day, July 4th, 1776, all acknowledge the providence of Almighty God in the foundation of our country. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and on down the line, they all acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. As I have studied the history of America, and I did so because I wanted to be an oracle of to speak the truth in regards to this great country. Because this great country represents a light, a beam of light in the darkness. That folks are coming whichever way they can to get here to be free. I said only in this country that a child can be dirt poor as a child. And by an adult, he could have possibly escalated into a magnitude of riches. Only in America. So as family, we stay focused on what it means to be free. You've heard me make reference to the fact that when I go to Coleman Prison, which is a rock throw away, as I'm preaching to the inmates, my teaching is always centered on them understanding that though you are constrained by these walls, you still have the opportunity to be free on the inside. To be free on the inside. So not only do I preach it to those who are incarcerated at the federal prison at FCC Coleman, but to those here in the church that our focus still is to be free on the inside. That's why Christ came, that we would be free. So, our founding fathers their focus was to come to this new found land and to push through to reach that pinnacle that they were focusing on which was called freedom. Now they wanted to be free from Great Britain. I'm amazed that as we read the histories of those men that the Lord used to formulate our government, our nation, those things that they spoke in regards to the Lord, George Washington. Look at what he says. The smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. One of many speeches for which you can extract concerning George Washington, a godly man. James Madison, another one of our presidents, we says, we have, look here, we have staked the whole future of America civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the whole of our political institution upon the 
captivity of mankind for self-government upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the commandments of God. The future and success of America is not in this constitution, but it is in the laws of God upon which this constitution is founded. John Quincy Adams. My custom is to read four or five chapters of the Bible every morning immediately after rising. It seems to me that the most suitable manner of beginning the day, it is an invaluable and inexhaustible mine of knowledge and virtue. Thomas Jefferson and everybody, you know, that you know, we 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 read a lot of things about how Jefferson had left the faith and so forth. I, I, I don't think so. The reason that Christianity is the best friend of government is because Christianity is the only religion that changes the heart. Mm. Now you all have heard about David, haven't you? King David? And we know that King David was God's man, wasn't he? A man after God's own heart. Did King David do anything wrong? Of course he did. We've heard about Solomon. Who the Lord said there would never be another man with the kind of wisdom that he gave Solomon. Did Solomon get off track? Yes, he did. See, when God uses an individual, it does not mean that that individual is going to be flawless. Because the only one who was, was Jesus. So the Lord will use men and women to do incomparable things. Yet they still have flaws. Yeah, they still struggle with things. Because if they didn't, then they wouldn't need Jesus, just as they did with us. This is why we pray each day, isn't it? So we must be sober. We must speak, look here, soberly concerning the negatives of America. <laughs> but we must champion the positives. In other words, we talk about the good things. This is my home. I don't know any other home. If somebody tells me I'm going to go somewhere else, I'm gonna go, what do you mean? You mean I'm going to go back to every place that I live? Because I ain't leaving these shores. I love it here. How about you? Do we have problems? Oh, yeah, we got problems. As I told you. On any given day, you came to 205 George Street where those eight kids were, you sit back and go, there's something bad going on in there. But all you could hear my mama say was, wait till your dad get home. And you know what? She would say that several times during the course of the day. But we knew when she said it about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the evening, we better pay attention. She can say it in the morning, and we know dad ain't gonna look here. Look, he ain't gonna be home until about 4 30. <laughs> but when she said it at 2 30, she knew. I mean, we knew that we better be pretty particular about what we do because she's gonna remember how we carried on. And when the big bopper came home, he didn't take any hostages. Y'all know what I'm talking about? No, he didn't take any hostages, man. Somebody had to pay. You know what I'm talking about? I hear this stuff about, you know, putting people away for child abuse. Lord have mercy. My daughter is here, so I ain't going to even go there with her because I know she can. She always tells me, but yeah, that you're pretty mean. Come on. No. I was frightened. I wanted her to do what's right. This next guy, 
you may not have heard of. Oh, stop it. Frederick Douglass, who was a slave, he tells a story where he tried to escape and got caught. And he tells a story about his, his, his plantation, his, his owner's wife, who took a liking to him and began teaching him in secret to read. It's a tremendous story. And he tells about, as he began to read and get a better understanding, he tried to escape, he was caught, and was beaten within inches of his life. But he finally, he finally got, he finally escaped. And it was amazing because he began to write, he began to read. And in his writing, well, he, he became an, uh, an evolution, uh, a, an evolutionist because there were people all over the colonies that felt that slavery was wrong. And he began to write so profoundly that it literally made those who said that slaves were not set to be educated, it made them have to back off of all of the things that they were saying because this slave was writing and articulating and identifying circumstances and situations that was contrary to the word of God. So here's the scenario. George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Hancock, all of those who came and wanted to move away from Britain's tyranny to be free now are engaged in activities to make other men be in the same situation they wanted to get away from. And here's John Hancock, I mean, here is Frederick Douglass saying, hey guys, hey, this is wrong. But he was a different kind of individual because he, he wanted to collaborate with folks. He wanted to talk with folks. He wanted to talk them through this situation, similar to what the Lord says, let us reason together. Though your sins be crimson red, they'll be made white as snow. So come sit down and let us reason together. But then there would look at, there was another gentleman, and you might be familiar with him. I don't know if that's me or what, Travis, it may be. Okay. You heard of him, Abraham Lincoln, right? Abraham Lincoln was president at one of the most critical periods in our nation's history. A nation divided by slavery, President Lincoln had to address the needs of both the North and the South during our Civil War. Both sides convinced that they were right. Both sides thought that God was on their side. Ooh. <laughs> you heard me say here, one side of the aisle is crying for justice and the other side of the aisle is crying for righteousness. And where does righteousness and justice come from? The Lord himself. Somebody got to be out of place. Somebody got to be missing it. The story goes that they were having this big meeting because, see, when they look at when they construct the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't something they all got together and say, "Let's do it." There was fighting going on in it because they couldn't agree who was going to write it. They couldn't even agree on when they were coming together because. Then they got to have some pastor that's going to oversee it all. And because they had all these different denominations, they were warring as to who would do it. So 
Look here. Our very existence has been differences. So in this, this big meeting with Abraham Lincoln, and a preacher stands up and say, Mr. President, let us all pray that God is on our side. And here's what Abraham Lincoln said to him. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. <laughs> my greatest concern is to be on God's side because God is always right. The one that we were in here this morning worshiping, the one that we love, the one that we cry out to, the one that's the center of our security, the one that's the center of our destiny, the one who loves us like no one else, he's always right. That's why I can wear these colors. I'm home. You know, let nobody mistake this. <laughs> I'm home. Oh, yeah. From sea to shining shore, I'm home. There are three types of freedom. There's freedom from, and that's the constraints of society. If someone wants to come and to stop you from doing the things for which your God-given right has given to you, what the Constitution gives to you, you can do it. And then there's the freedom to, and that is to do whatever it is you want to do, as long as you don't break the rules. If I want to get a car and paint it, Purple and green and red, whatever, whatever but it, it, my prerogative. That's what this great country gives to us. The freedom too. And then there's the freedom to be. And the freedom to be is to be who the Lord meant us to be. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus stepped out of eternity into time. That's why Jesus became what he created, man. That's why Jesus humbled himself to become a baby. That's why he stepped out of his glory. The creator became his creation to save his creation. Yeah. This is more, much, much more. And sometimes because we don't know, the lack of knowledge constrains us to this place that is second chair in nature. There's the first chair and there's the second chair. The first chair is in touch. It's, it's touching it. The second chair is getting it. What's left over, what's coming over. Look at I want to be in that first chair. I want to be have an intimate relationship with the Lord that I know my rights and my privileges. I know that if God be for me, who could be against me? I know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to the riches and glory of Jesus Christ. I know that he will fight for me. I could be in a lot of other places in the world. But he saw forward that I would be here for such a time as this. I know that my days are limited, but I intend to get everything that he has set forward for me. Because after all, Jesus died for me. Did he die for you? Today we have the opportunity also to partake in the Lord's Supper. And remember, the last time we did this, the Lord's Supper we spoke about, the Lord's Supper represents the past, the present, and the future. 
what Jesus did when he brought them in. And it was the Passover celebration. And when we think about the Passover, we are reminded in the book of Exodus that the children of Israel had been in, in bondage for 400 years. And the Lord came down and he sent Moses And as he sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go so that they would go into the desert and learn to worship him. And Pharaoh said no. Ten times, different circumstances and situations. And the very last time that he said no, Scripture tells us that the God, that the Lord had made a decision at that point in time that a man heart was hardened that he was going to harden it that the man could not say okay i'm gonna let you go and he sent this last curse upon egypt which is their firstborn and each family would die scripture tells us that the death angel came through egypt that night but he passed over he passed over the doors up to you. the Israelites. And they had to take, the, take blood from an unblemished lamb. And they had to wipe it across the door. Everywhere there was a Jewish family that took the blood of the lamb. And the death angel passed over that home. But where there wasn't that blood, the firstborn in that family would die. After that, Pharaoh decided that it was too much and that he gave them permission to leave. And that is known as a Passover. When we have that Passover celebration, the Lord commanded them that they would, that they would do that. And they would do it in remembrance. God commanded the Israelites to commemorate his great deliverance always through the Passover celebration. So here we are now in the New Testament. And God's people are in captivity just as they were in Egypt. And the Lord says, sends the one who he had Isaiah to speak about eight, nine hundred years earlier, about the one who's coming. And we see in Luke 4 and 18. Jesus gets up to the podium at one of the gatherings in the synagogue and he, he bellows out just what Isaiah had foretold. He says this in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for all of the prisoners and to recover sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of sin. Back in the Old Testament, it was the Egyptians. Slavery, bondage. Here in the New Testament, it was bondage, slavery to sin. That Jesus comes, it's the unblemished lamb, and that each of us who trust him, each of us who declare him to be our savior, we're baptized 
we are covered with the blood of Jesus. The blood that was shed on the cross. The blood that was shared during the Via Della Rosa when he bled on our behalf. The same way the death angel passed over in Egypt. He passed over us. We are no longer condemned to sin and death. We now have life. And we have it through him. The bondage of sin. God has revealed to us a stunning reality. One event radically altered the very nature of man in the planet on which we live. That event was the rebellion of Adam. Because of Adam's sin, the entire human race was plunged into sin. <laughs> but because of Adam, great Jehovah provided for us a path to be free from sin. And it too is called Passover. See, there it was at the Passover celebration where Jesus humbled himself. Jesus washed feet during that time. Jesus made clear that he, he was the Passover lamb. And the scripture tells us that when the meal was ended, that he took the bread and he took the wine. And he said to them this, and today we can have a better recollection of when we hear this, what he's saying to us. In as much as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You know, for all practical purposes, we might think, well, what we are remembering is the sharing of the bread and the wine. But I think as we go a little deeper, Jesus wants us to remember that he is our Passover. Lamb. And that what the Spirit of God did, releasing them from bondage in Egypt, the same Spirit is doing in us today. And we're released from the tyranny and the bondage of sin. See, when I think about America, I love to get my car and drive. I love to go to different cities and to see the people and to see the monuments and to see the valleys and the mountains and to see the ocean and to see the cornfields. Because it is so beautiful. And this is God's country. And the Lord has quite an investment in this country. He has his son, Jesus, and then he has us to represent him. You know, if I only wore the shirt on this day to commemorate the 4th of July, and then for the rest of the year, I deny it. I'm not a good representation of it. And that's what we have to be mindful of. We are blood-bought Christians. And it can't be that just on Sunday, I represent our Father. It has to be every single day. I may not have the shirt on that is boisterous and says loud, he's a patriot. But from my service and in the manner in which I live, they can say, he is. That's what the Lord wants of us. 
You see, the blood of Jesus covers and protects us. And his body was broken to free us from eternal death. And that's everything. Look at what Paul says. To get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new, unleavened batched as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know what that is? Humble yourself and know that he is God. My, 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 the youngest of, of the two boys here, and his name is Messiah. Kenneth Messiah. We had a conversation the other night, about one in the morning. My two grandsons are nocturnal. I think that's what you say. They stay up all night. Well, you know, now that school is over, they stay up all night and won't sleep all day. But during the day, the grandfather get him up and say, hey, come on out here and help me. The oldest was sweating like a pig, like I was the other day fixing the lawnmower tractor. Didn't we? Man, look at here. It was something, wasn't it? And you didn't think, look, you didn't think your grandfather was going to get there for a while, huh? It didn't look good or sound good, huh? But I never cussed. I don't cuss. I just, I was, woo, I was angry. Yes, I was. I couldn't get it done, but I said, Lord, help me. Every time I say, Holy Spirit, help me, he would help me. Because I had to take the bottom of that lawnmower off. And I'm telling you, I used to be afraid of it. Then I had to go up in the guts. Then I had to, to steering column and all of that stuff. And I'm going, but I got it done. After about an hour and a half, two hours, I put that baby back together. And I ran around that cutting grass. And my wife was so proud of me. She sit back and go, hmm, he took it apart and he would have put it back together. Because normally I take it apart and get somebody else to put it back together. <laughs> but, the, but the little one, Masai, we had a conversation about one o'clock or so in the morning. And I was going over with him. I said, you know what, Masai, your mom, your uncle, and your aunt can testify of this conversation that I had with them, I'm having with you, that you are not an island. You are not an island. And I said, do you understand what an island represents? He goes, yes, uh, it's alone. I said, you're exactly right. You are part of a family. And whatever goes on with you goes on with the family. And I say that to you. I say that to Christians around this country. You are not an island. What you do, what you say, how you respond, you're part of God's family. You have to be mindful of that. You can't lose because that is what sanctifies us. That's what sets us apart. And this is what the Lord wants us to know. See, in John 1 and 29, you don't have to go there. This is what John declared when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world, sins of man. Do you know what it's like to know that your sins are forgiven? That's amazing. When the Lord sees me, he sees the blood of his son, Jesus. Jesus entrusted his followers to remember his sacrifice continually through the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to ask the deacons to come now. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to pray. Yeah, come, Larry and John. As I said earlier, we must be sober concerning the negatives of America but we also must champion the positives because there is more to love in America than there is to hate. And particularly, 
we Christians, we who are of the Father's family. Amen. So while they're preparing the elements, I want to give you a moment, if you would bow and want to pray for the Lord's cleansing for each of us as we partake in the elements. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we love you. And you've made clear to us that the love that we declare that we have for you, that we're to have it for one another. So we ask now to wash us with the washing of the water of the word of God. To do in us that which you and only you can do, Father God. Cleanse us, give to us a clean heart and the right spirit. Let us be mindful. Help us to see through your eyes and to hear through your ears and to perceive with your heart, a pliable heart, a humble heart. Because a humble heart, a congrats spirit, you will not despise. And for that, Father God, we say thank you continuously. We love you. We trust you. Help us. Help us to love with the God kind of love. Help us, Father God, not to be fault finders. Help us, Father God, to, Lord, to, to, to render each and every one greater than ourselves. We humble ourselves and we pray for one another. We pray for weaknesses because the spirit of God intercede on the behalf of our weaknesses. So guide us now, prepare us now as we come to take the elements. Make us ready, Father. In Jesus' glorious, wonderful name we pray. And all say together, amen. All righty. Travis, you want to get Addie and the girls over? Okay. You need to leave for for Miss Linda, for Jenna, and for Addie and Layla. Just just leave four back on the desk for them when they come. Leave four of those on the desk for them. John. John. Carry four of those and just put them on the desk for Miss Linda on the desk, on the computer desk.
Okay, we're gonna wait. We're gonna try and wait for uh, him to come from. And one for Miss Linda. You got it. Okay. No, I think you. Okay. The scripture tells us. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it. And gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. And gave it to them saying, drink from it all of ye. For this is my blood for the new the family of God. What holds us together is far greater than anything that could possibly separate us. Amen. So be in prayer today, tonight, tomorrow morning, as we are bringing in children from Adamsville, from Coleman, from Leesburg, and Jenna and her team are going to be leading them in the ways of Christ. We're excited about it because a young life could be changed. A young life could be altered. That's what we're expecting. And you know, that's exactly why it is we're here. We're here to give back to the next generation. Amen. Bow your head, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, Father God, that you have used me today to bring forward the, not only the history of this country, but how this country was formulated by you and how you use men and you continue to use men and women to bring about the essence of what it means to be free. And that is who we are in America. God bless America. May your hand be upon her, always. Bless her indeed. Increase our borders of righteousness. Keep us from sin that we would not cause pain. This house, each of us, in Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray. And all said together, amen. God bless you guys. Don't eat too much. <laughs>